You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. Hello and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Leila Mohemani. A lifelong musician and California native, Leila's introduction to audio spanned from early experimentation with her play school tape recorder to running the soundboard while volunteering at a local public access TV studio in high school. She graduated from UCLA's Herb Alpert School of Music in 2017 with a BA in music history and a minor in music industry while spending most of her time hosting a math rock radio show and running live sound for the music school and radio station. She has since gone on to run live sound at Venues ranging from Hotel Utah and the Cats to Jan Popper Theater and Schoenberg Hall at UCLA. After graduation, Layla interned at Stone's Throw Records before deciding to shift her focus back towards audio and enrolling in Foothill Co- College's music technology program. Lila started at Women's Audio Mission as an intern before getting hired in 2019. She has since engineered numerous podcasts, including Rebel Eaters Club and Hella High, and audiobooks such as The Victory Machine. The Making and Unmaking of the Warriors Dynasty. She has also assisted on sessions for Gina Madrid, Side Pony, and Divinity Rocks and the OGs. Layla prides herself on being Wham's unofficial guitar pedal guru, and above all, is thrilled to be teaching and engineering on the staff of such an incredibly valuable organization. Former guest Packy Lundholm recommended I reach out to Layla, so it's a pleasure to have her on the show. Welcome to Secret Sonics, Layla. Thank you so much, Ben. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So, so tell us briefly a bit about how you got started getting involved in production. I mean, I've been playing um, instruments. I started playing like instruments around the age of five with like piano and then played flute for four years. Um, but I consider that to be my lost period and then huh. made my way to uh, guitar and then um, kind of on, I was also at a younger age, very interested in like musical theater and like video production in particular. Um, so musical theater led me to doing choir for four years. Um, and then after high school, I picked up electric bass. Um, but I think the entire time I was playing all these instruments, it was, which was just kind of a um, given for me that it was like never a question in my life, even though I don't come from a musical family at all. Neither of my parents are musicians. Um, they're both um, Silicon Valley tech people. But my brother um, mm. has been playing classical piano for 23 years, I think now, something to that extent. Um, so he and I are both musical, but um, I was always fascinated by um, recording and production. I think just kind of growing up in Silicon Valley, I started like working on computers around the age of like four um, and was I, I became my parents tech support person by the age of eight. So I was just kind of very like technologically centric. Wait, and, so they're working in high tech and you're the one giving them tech support. Yeah, yeah. They're the <laughs> ones who, yeah, I mean, I was like, I don't know, I just kind of picked it up naturally, I think, because for them, they were kind of, like, constantly learning and having to adapt, whereas for me, I, this was just, like, the norm. This is how I was raised. So I think I had, I had an easier time at the age of eight picking it up, like, than they did having, like, gone to school for it and done everything. But, yeah, so yeah. I've kind of had, like, a natural, like, knack for technology and just... When I was when I would listen to music, I would just I've always just kind of really been fascinated in like how the sounds were created and like what the like I would just kind of pick out the most insignificant elements and just fixate on them. And I thought recording studios were like the most magical place. Um but for a while and like all throughout high school, I didn't realize that you could be that you could have music as a career and not be like a world class performer, which I never have been. Like I've, I played a lot of different instruments, but up until like well after high school, never really developed a sort of like ownership or like I, I still wouldn't consider myself to, like have mastery, but like proficiency. I just kind of I really enjoyed the action of playing and didn't really care how it sounded, um, which I thought kind of eliminated me from doing music as a profession but then I kind of learned about audio engineering and music technology and kind of found out what like an audio engineer does and what a music producer does and I was like oh that's perfect because that just means I need to be obsessed with music 
essentially. And that's kind of why I like studied music history because that was just immersing yourself in music and just like being a total dork for a major. Yeah. So I just, I, I think it was just kind of this um, love of music and, um, and like playing and later performing and just kind of being constantly immersed in music with the combined with this natural knack of technology. And then the whole, um, I guess actual like engineering side of it was actually a segue from, um, like live from like um, public access TV. That was my first like exposure to like an audio mixer was, um, running live sound, um, at a public access TV station that I volunteered at. So yeah, I think it's just kind of been, a amalgamation of all of these different um, fascinations and obsessions I have within like music and sound, just getting really into um, guitar pedals and different tones. And like, I think that's kind of why I have a very sort of, I guess, diverse portfolio up until this point is because I just have all of these different fascinations that all just happen to center around audio. That's awesome. Yeah, I, f I find that a lot of musicians that kind of are like, you know, um, jack of all trades, master of none in terms of like instruments. Like it like, seems to be like something that that uh, correlates with being a music producer, mm -hmm. like, you know, good enough at the bass and at the guitar and at the piano, but yeah. I'm not like amazing. I'm yeah. not like a virtuoso at any of these instruments. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you have like a favorite album growing up that like maybe was one of the things that really got you into exploring sound and, and listening to those like fine details? I don't know. I feel like I kind of internalized music in such a way where it was almost to the point of just kind of like, I feel like I didn't like internalize music so much as I almost like digested it. I'm sure like 90% of people you ask that question, you like mentioned the Beatles as being formative. The uh, the music that I was listening to w around the time that I kind of was like trending in the direction of wanting to pursue music and pursue audio tech as a career was like, I remember Red Hot Chili Peppers being like massive for me at the time. I remember actually um, Packy was the person who kind of like, f like in a way kind of first turned me on to guitar pedals because like on I Fight Dragons, the second EP, um, on one of the tracks, it opens up with this like really gnarly um, fuzz, like guitar fuzz sound that I just like hit him up because um, we'd already like connected at that time and was just like, hey, what is that? And he was like, oh, Zvex Fuzz Factory. And that just kind of like got me down the rabbit hole of guitar pedals. So I don't know if there was any music in particular. I think part of it is because I was raised with such a variety of music like um, my brother strictly listens to classical music, so I, like, all of my childhood memories is, like, Beethoven and Mozart. Hmm. Um, my dad is very much into jazz, so there was lots of, like, Miles Davis and Ella Fitzgerald, um, which I didn't, like, and I, but I didn't know that that's who those artists were until, like, college when I kind of, like, did, re rediscovered them in my classes and was like oh this is the music I like grew up listening to and then my mom kind of was very into like Beatles and also like like Depeche Mode um and also has like wow. pre like pretty eclectic taste. and then I th but I think like kind of um rock music as a whole like my mom like I remember just like would listen to a lot of like early Beatles and we had like Abbey Road and like Paul McCartney like back in the U.S. live album was like these are all the stuff that was like in our car CD players that was just kind of like um, constantly surrounded by. But I, I feel like much of my music development, I was very kind of rock centric because I was like playing guitar um, and that was kind of very like self paved. And then when I started playing bass, that kind of um, re like reinvigorated my exploration of like Stevie Wonder and like Jacob Pastorius because um, I play fretless bass primarily actually. I, oh um, really? Yeah, Do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been pl I think I've been playing fretless bass for about five, at least five years now. I recently um, just I just purchased my first um, fretted bass uh, maybe even earlier this year. It's been and I, before that I was playing strictly fretless. Um, that's and wild. The, I, it took like the perfect, yeah. I mean, I I love it. So it's like, I mean, I'm t I tend to be very like self critical about myself as an instrumentalist because, like, I mean, I don't consider myself to like have mastery over anything, but I do kind of pride myself on my whole style of bass. Just pretty much came from 
my favorite bassist in the world is Eric Avery of Jane's Addiction. Um, but I play um, on a fretless jazz bass without a pick. And that's kind of where my entire um, like playing style came from. And then just kind of having like <laughs> using like harmonics and extended techniques from like like listening to a lot of math rock and I'd say at least half of my friends who make music um, play in like math rock esque outfits. <laughs> so it's kind of just a massive like combination of everything. But yeah, I think just yeah, like when it getting into um, fretless bass and kind of exploring a lot of that. And now these days, I'm getting. I think because um, my um, friend and my primary collaborator is a um, in addition to being a very talented like engineer songwriter um composer could go on and on um he's a phenomenal vocalist so i think i'm spending time with him i've kind of gotten it a lot like a lot into um sort of like r&b and these really sort of um just incredible vocalists and getting more into the sort of like i'd say more r&b than pop but definitely kind of that sort of end of the spectrum Nice. So, did yeah. did you did you have an aha moment when you realized you're going to be doing mu- like music and audio for the long haul? I, yeah, I think it was just kind of summer after I graduated from um, high school. I was um, kind of like decided to forego the typical um, college experience, and I just um, without applying to any schools, just went straight to community college. And um, yeah, I just remember having like meeting some new people. Um, that summer and I had no I, I knew I loved music but I didn't but I thought I was going to major in like communications or do something with film or because those just seemed like more um realistic careers um but I just remember having multiple conversations with a lot of different people and I would just talk non-stop about um Jimi Hendrix's pedal board and guitar tone or like these like red hot chili peppers like b-sides or whatever it was i was listening to at the time and people would just ask me like oh are you studying music in school and i said no that's crazy why would you like where is that coming from why would you ask (laughs) like um because i guess like no one had ever presented it to me as an option so i was just kind of like again i didn't know that like majors like music history or um audio engineering even existed so i think kind of as people started to ask it to me as if it was a totally normal thing to be doing, um, that kind of made me realize like, oh, okay, this, like, this could be a thing. And then, so when I started like taking college classes, it was, I kind of came to realize like, okay, yeah, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna get out of this world alive, like it's gonna be music. (laughs) That's gonna do that for me. Yeah. Wow. I totally hear that. It's like, those who can't really do anything else, we end up just doing music, right? Like, yeah. it's just it's such a it's such a passion. Uh, yeah, absolutely, it's, I felt like it's not. I'm not one of those people who it's like. I feel like if I was forced into it, I could have another job. I would just be miserable doing it. I would just be like constantly unfulfilled. So the fact that I have been able to actually make it a career, but also continue to have these um, passion projects and these great collaborations with like friends has been, I think the ultimate blessing. Yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> so, so tell me a bit about uh, women's audio mission. Uh, what is it and what's your role there? Yeah. So women's audio mission, it's um, an organ, it's a nonprofit organization based out of San Francisco. Uh, we're the only recording studio in the world that's built, owned, operated, designed entirely by women, gender non-conforming, non-binary, and trans folks. And we've been around for about seventeen and a half years now. And yeah, wow. we also it's both um, a recording studio and also like an educational facility. So we teach classes as well. We teach. Um, adult classes on like Pro Tools and Ableton and um, like studio recording and mic placement. Um, We have like introduction to mastering classes. And we also teach um, classes like um, youth classes to middle and high school girls. I'm also one of the um, instructors in that program called Girls on the Mic. Um, So yeah, and our goal is to... um, get more women, girls, and yet trans non-binary um, folks into the field of audio because 